welcome to the Project Management Prepcast, helping you prepare for the PMP exam. Here's your instructor, Cornelius Fichtner. Hello and welcome to the Project Management Prepcast, where we take you to the PMP exam. I am your instructor, Cornelius Fichtner. The PMP exam is an experience-based exam. Yes, there will be some questions that test your memory of facts, but most of them will be situational. Here, you have to apply your experience to the question while remaining within the PMBOK guide framework in order to find the correct answer. This lesson here is about how to apply the concept of authority from the PMBOK guide into the real world. Because when your projects fail, your sponsor will call only one person into his or her office to discuss this failure. And that person is you. As the project manager, you are responsible for the success and failure of your projects. And that holds true, even if the reason for this failure was outside of your span of control. Even if you work in a matrix environment in which project managers often lack formal authority. Yes, we all know that responsibility and authority should be in balance, but more often than not, your responsibility outweighs the formal authority that you receive. You have to fall back on other forms of authority, referent authority, expert authority, reward authority, and penalty authority. Thomas Cudding has written a series of articles on authority on his blog, and we are happy to have him on the lesson right now. We look in detail at the various types of authority, how they apply in a matrix organization and in a projectized organization. And we look at what you can do to regain your authority if you think that you have lost it. As project managers, we don't think about authority often enough. It seems to be something that just sort of happens. This discussion will give you a lot of good information in preparation for the PMP exam. Here's a little about our guest, and then we'll go right into the interview. Thomas Cutting is a senior principal consultant with over 15 years of IT experience in the entertainment, retail, insurance, banking, healthcare, and automotive verticals. Managing, training, mentoring, and working in this diverse background has provided him with the basics for his writing and speaking engagements. From programmer to project manager, business analyst to quality assurance analyst, he experienced firsthand the problems that teams face. As SQA team lead at one of Keen's largest outsourcing engagements, he trained project teams and audited them to ensure adherence to development processes. He mentored project managers, listened to their issues, and worked with them to find solutions. His publications include articles for Computer World and Inform IT, and he has spoken at conferences for the Project Management Institute, Practical Software Quality and Testing, and the Southern California Quality Assurance Association. He is a regular contributor to several project management websites and forums. Hello, Tom, and welcome back to the program. It's great to be back. Wonderful. Glad to have you. Glad to have you. Today, we want to take a look at authority, because authority is something that every project manager needs. Now, you've uh, you've actually written about authority in your blog. You're still writing about it, I believe. You haven't finished all the episodes yet, right? Yes, I have a couple more to go. Okay. And we want to take a look at that. My first question has to be, why write about authority at all? Why is it important? I think it's important uh, to talk about because sometimes as a project manager, we don't understand the authority that we do have. And um, the more I've looked at authority levels, uh, the more I understand how they work. And I think the more you understand about them, the easier they become to use. You understand what you're doing when you apply something in your email to someone. You are actually using a level of authority when you write that email mm -hmm. uh, or when you have a status meeting. You know, what gives you the right to have a status meeting? 
those types of things will come out as you're understanding what your authority level is and how you can use that to further the project. You've also used this as an input for a presentation within your company, right? Yes, uh, that's um, where the idea originated for the blog. I uh, put together a presentation and talked through it with a bunch of other project managers, which is a great way of getting better ideas that you can make your own, actually. It's not really (laughs) plagiarism if you're the chairperson of the meeting. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) So let's jump right into this. Let's start out with the definition. How would you define authority? Okay, I think there's a couple ways of doing this. If you look at maybe the Webster's type definition of authority... It says something to the effect of authority is the right and power to command and be obeyed or the power to do something. What I like about that definition is that it gives you both sides of it. It gives you the right and also the power. So if you think about it, the right to do something without the power to influence it is just futile. And if you have the power to do something, but you don't have the right to do it, it just becomes tyranny. So I like that part of the definition. The PMI, the Project Management Institute, definition of it talks specifically to um, the right to apply project resources, expend funds, make decisions, or give approvals. And I think for this discussion, that's a little too narrowly focused. Uh, That has to do specifically with projects, um, but maybe not the level I want to talk about today, which brings it back to the resource management level. How How does your authority level play at that field? So what I'm probably suggesting for a definition is that authority is the responsibility to manage your resources, that would be your people, products, and your funds, to the full extent of your influence. Now, what I've done there a little bit is is substituted the word responsibility for right because I wanted to convey that you do have a responsibility. It's more than just, hey, I can use these people. It's, hey, I have uh, some sort of responsibility toward them. And then also using the word influence instead of power. I think as project managers, traditionally you don't think of it as power, but it's it's how you can use your authority to influence how your project progresses, how your team members interact, and how you uh, manage to survive on a day-to-day basis. There are the four typical types of authority that everyone always talks about. I mean, those are also the ones that you have to know for the PUP exam, right? Now, those are just the standard ones. Uh, they are positional power uh, authority, a referent authority, reward and penalty authority, and then the last one is the expert authority. So let's let's delve into those four and let's take a look at those four. What are they all about? Let's start out with uh, which one? Pos- positional, right? Yes, I think that's a good one to start with because it uh, is based on where you sit in the organizational chart. It doesn't necessarily have much to do with your abilities or any other part of why you're there. It has to do with where you're at. Uh, Sometimes it's also referred to as formal authority. And really, it's bestowed on you by some entity. If you think about it, um, the CEO of a company, he is given that authority because the board voted him in, right? So his authority only lasts as long as the board wants him there. Uh, For a project manager, they received their right to manage from an approved charter, uh, maybe the statement of work, or some other defining document. Once it's approved, that gives them the authority to do whatever's within the scope of their project. It doesn't give them authority beyond that. It just gives them that authority. Um, I think, um, interesting thing, culture plays a lot with the level of the Mm -hmm. positional authority. Some cultures are very strongly oriented toward if you're in charge, then you're in charge and I must follow. I think here in the States, we tend to be a little more, yeah, you have positional authority, but you better come to the table with something more than just a uh, a, a name in the, on the org chart. And I can also tell you that, and we're going to go into that in, in a little while, it also has a lot to do with the type of organization that you're in, of course. Mm-hmm. Right. Uh, in my case, for instance, I'm in a weak matrix organization as a project manager. So my authority is very limited. I have to follow what the functional managers want to do. So that's, that's another point. Even though I am the project manager, even though I'm receiving a certain formal power through the project charter, I have to defer to the business managers and I have to listen to what they actually want to do. So they still hold most of the power. 
Yeah, they do. It's, it's probably also the type of power that can be most often abused, right? Yeah, I would say it tends to be abused. Um, and we've seen instances of that um, from you know your, your typical harassment suits um, to any dictatorial uh, type of authority. Um, it's the type of authority that can easily go to your head, I think. It's, it's bestowed on you, so, hey, I must be somebody. Yeah, power corrupts. Absolute power corrupts absolutely. Yes. Yeah, it's the kind that says, whose name's on the on the door you just walked in? That's that kind of authority. <laughs> and it's, it's, so it's easy to get over that. It becomes painfully obvious when someone starts to abuse that, that authority. It's, it's not pretty. <laughs> right. All right, so much for the positional type of authority. Next, we had the referent type of authority. What's that all about? Okay, referent authority is really based on your character. Um, it's based on uh, your personality. People tend to like to work for people who are good-natured, um, who are caring, who take an interest in their employees as more than the hours they can bill or the things they can do. Interestingly, though, some people are drawn to project managers who are on the dark side of things. So if you've got a, a very strong... I don't want to use the word maniacal, but but uh, <laughs> but you understand what I mean. The 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 uh, a pushy pushy um, type of manager. Uh, some people enjoy working for that. They like to be around that sense of power. So it can be any type of characteristic that you have, but it's it's referent authority is based on your character. It's not any. It's not based on your um on your position anymore. It has to do with who you are. So that's very that that means you have to do a lot of relationship building then for that kind of power to actually work, be it in the positive, the good guy, or the negative, bad guy kind of sense. Yeah, interestingly, whereas positional authority is more political in nature, uh -huh. uh, referent authority is more social in nature. It has okay. to do with how you interact with other people. Now, how does that work? In, in, uh, how do I get it, that kind, of, that kind of authority? Am I just nice to people all the time and... Or, or, or how do I do it? Um, one of the ways is, is being helpful. Okay. Being, being in a company that uses a lot of foreign help. One of the individuals within the company is, one of the ones that actually reports to me, is going for his green card right now. Okay. And there's a lot of paperwork that needs to be filled out and a lot of signatures and everything. Um, and most of those I don't do. I, I don't have the proper uh, positional authority, if you will, to sign those papers or get them pushed through, and he has to fill out a lot of them. But what I can do is um, let him know that I'm there to help him with anything. I can uh, maybe make a phone call to HR to push it further. Uh, maybe I can uh, talk to the lawyer and make sure that they got the paperwork that he's trying to push through and, in general, be showing that I'm caring about him mm -hmm. by helping him with this process. Um, I think another another part of it is just calling him on a regular basis to say, hey, what's the status of it? Are you making progress on this? And letting him know that as a person, I value what he can bring to the company and therefore I want to help him gain this access, gain his um the green card. You know, this, this sounds very much like the old saying that as a project manager, you're the person who puts down the tracks in front of the moving train, mm -hmm. right? So you're the guy who, who helps your team resolve the issues, who's there for them. They can come to you. They can look up to you and you will make sure that they can get their work done. That's, that's, is, is that referent power in, in a sense? That is certainly feeds into it, yeah. I mean, it's, it's anything or like building that. building referent power, rather, yeah. Right. It, it's anything like that that you can use to show that you care about your team. Right. Or um, that you are able to get things accomplished for them uh, and, and build your character. If you take another look at it, integrity factors into this, right? So if, I am, if I'm someone who keeps my word... If, when I make a promise, I keep my promises. People are drawn to that. Any character trait that people are drawn to 
is referent power. It's it's them coming to you because um, you're a good person. Them coming to you because when you say something, it's it's accomplished, um, and you don't back down anywhere. Those types of character traits, if you will, are what referent power mm-hmm. is about. You know, looking back now to what the two we've looked at, positional and referent power, and, and looking forward to the reward, penalty, and expert power, I think they overlap. I don't think one works without the other. Because let's let's assume you've, you're given the positional power, right? You are the project manager in charge of a $10 million project. You will also need some referent power you will make have to make sure that people look up to you and they respect you and you receive their referent power. But, and we'll see that in a minute, they also need to look up to you because you're an expert, right? Right. So do they go hand in hand? Do I see this right? One of the things I see about positional authority is that it's a good starting point, mm-hmm. but you're not going to make it through life just because of where you sit on okay. the okay. chart. Okay, okay. So... You can use that as a starting point, but then you immediately need to build some of these other uh, types of authority that we're working on. Like you said earlier, you have to bring something else to the table. Right, 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 exactly. Okay. Uh, Same with referent authority. You can be the nicest guy in the world, but if you don't use any of your other authority levels, then people eventually get tired of a nice guy. Right, all right. Move on. Moving on, uh, reward and penalty power. What is that all about? That sounds like I'm taking the whip out. Um, that's the carrot and the stick idea, right? <laughs> so, uh, it's, it's both the positive reinforcement and the punishment to motivate people. Obviously, balance is the key in this. Too much reward and it becomes expected. Uh, too much punishment and people leave. But both are required. If you think about it, without rewards, people don't feel appreciated. They don't feel like they, um, get anything for their effort. But on the other hand, if you don't give consequences for poor performance, your good performers are going to start wondering why they're good, right? If there's no distinction between the way you treat your bad performers and your good performers, there's no incentive to be a good performer. For the longest time, I didn't feel I had any of this type of authority. As a project manager, um, especially just starting out, you think, you know, what types of rewards can I give? I don't have the authority to give anybody a raise. I don't have the authority even to fire somebody if I don't think they're doing well. So where does my authority, what's what's my reward penalty authority here? I don't understand it. But as I look at it, as I mature as a project manager, if you look at it from the perspective of you could give better assignments to the better performers, Mm -hmm. you can give kind of the less exciting assignments to those that aren't performing well. Um, give more responsibility to a good performer and less to someone who, who doesn't perform. You can give good comments on annual reviews, right? Mm-hmm. That's what I was just going to say because that's what I do. Like I said, I'm in a weak matrix organization, so mm-hmm. very little mm-hmm. reward or penalties that I can give. But I can send an email. I can send an email to the supervisor of the person who's on my project Of course, always CC to that person as well, so he or she knows that I've said something good about them, right? Right. So I I do that quite often, making sure that people know that I appreciate them. And occasionally, I even bring them a bottle of wine, paying them out of my own pocket, of course. Yes, that's that's exactly right. Annual reviews are a great place uh, as well to contribute to that. Um, And if you're coming into a team that historically is is tough to work with or you've got a group of people who don't normally give more than 50 percent letting them know in some maybe subtle ways that you do have access to uh, contribute to those annual reviews is always a good thing too Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the other thing is recommendations i mean certainly with your emails that you're sending you're probably also saying hey is you know maybe on the side not copying the person you're talking about but is there anything we can do for this individual can we uh, maybe give him a raise maybe you know is he ready for the next level of yeah. authority or whatever okay just helping wherever you can mm-hmm, mm-hmm. all right so that was the reward and penalty power or authority and then finally the expert authority the expert authority i think is probably 
the strongest type of authority, uh, just from the perspective that it's based on your abilities, something that you've proven. It's the respect that the team gives you or that management gives you. And yeah, it's not the respect that Al Capone got when he started uh, beating people up if they didn't respect him. It's the type of respect that, um, well, you get it from successfully managing projects. If you've got a history of successfully managing projects, you're an expert. If you've got a history of, of knowing things, maybe that's, you know, your knowledge becomes an expert level. And you're always, you've always got a good answer. You're always giving people um, good direction. That's also a type of expert authority. If you think about um, even in the development realm, right, who is the person who has authority among the programmers? It's the one everybody's always going to with questions. That's a type of authority. One of the ways you can gain this, obviously, is, is just by demonstrating your um, abilities to do that. But another interesting thing is getting that authority granted to you by um, some other authority. If you think about it, if you have the initials PMP after your name, well, that gives you a certain level of authority. If you have uh, maybe an uh, MBA or a PhD, those types of things are granted to you by some other authority figure, right? And they bear with it a certain level of expertise. Right, but then again, almost anyone can get certified somewhere, right? So the three letters behind your name are probably not going to be enough. Again, uh, like with uh, positional authority, it's a good starting point, but if you can't back it up, yeah, it's not going to last long. Right. One of the other interesting things that happens, um, if you, for example, get published, then it's funny how people take that as, oh, well, now you're the expert, right? Right. You've got um, a book that's been printed. Or you, even articles in, right, in right. some publication. Uh -huh. um, I had an instance uh, probably last spring where I was trying to mentor this new project manager and just wouldn't hardly give me the time of day uh, until he found out that I have several articles in Computer World that are published. Um, for some reason in his eyes, I, certain, I suddenly became an expert. I was telling him the same stuff. He was still listening to the same stuff. But now it was as if you know, I was suddenly somebody, right? Somebody he should listen to. And it was just, it's, it's odd at times when that happens, when people, you know, I do have a couple articles published. I don't go around, you know, first time I meet somebody, hey, you want to read my article? Uh, but when people find out, it, it does, it gives you a certain level of expert authority. And um, so that's one way you can gain that as well. Right. Okay. So we've looked at those four types of authority. Now, it's not enough to know about them just in, in theory. We also have to, to see them in action in the organizations. I've already talked about my situation here as a project manager in a weak matrix organization. So let's look at how you can survive in a matrix organization and then also go to the other spectrum of this. Let's look at what you do and how you implement this in a projectized organization. So what are your thoughts about authority of a project manager in a matrix organization? I think probably the best way of, of working through this is perhaps starting by understanding what a, a functional organization, a projectized organization are. So if we take that step back maybe for a second, um, a functional organization like the one more that you're in is uh, made up of, of silos, really. Um, each area has a, an area of specialization. Yeah, finance, marketing, IT, even, sales. Yeah, even within IT, you can break it down. And, you know, there might be a server group. There might be a web development group. There's the legacy people, you know, over there and, and the security group. Everything is a silo, and each one of those areas is led by an expert in that area. A manager. Right. Yeah. And the manager is usually an expert in, in whatever, right? So um, projects within those organizations rely on pulling people from each of these silos, mm -hmm. banding them loosely together in order to accomplish something, or even, even to the extent of just borrowing them, begging and borrowing them 
for a short period of time to accomplish a task on it. Uh, the interesting thing in that environment is that those resources know no matter how this project ends up, whether it's successful or not, they have a home to go back exactly. to. Exactly. I'll still have a job. They know that they report to that functional manager. They don't really report to you. Mm -hmm. And that's what you were talking that's about earlier. what I'm stuck in. Yeah. Right. And that's what we were talking about earlier where it's, and we'll see this a little bit later, um, where it's important to find the hook, right? The hook is, well, I talk to your functional manager mm -hmm. and I let him know how you're doing. Yes. Now, the projectized organization is the pretty much the exact opposite. It's where projects are pulled together for a certain scope. And in, in those types of environments, you're not based on what functional area you're in. It's a project pulled together. Probably the best example of it is in a consulting organization where um, a consulting agency um, – is awarded a project with a client with a client and then they pull together all the resources that they need in order to accomplish that project go do it yeah for and six then, months they're working on on the client's yeah, project right six yeah. months a year two years however long it is it's the focus of that and then at the end of that the project's disbanded if you think of uh, perhaps um in nasa a launch is a project. They pull everybody in together and work on getting this thing up into the air. Mm -hmm. uh, at the, when that's accomplished, well, then that team's disbanded and maybe another one's started for the next launch. But it's all project-oriented. It's not functional area-oriented. Okay. So we've got the differences here. Mm -hmm. What about authority now? Where where does does it differ? What do you need maybe differently even? Okay. Okay. Um, from that perspective, if we – most projects probably happen in between the two mm -hmm, mm -hmm. in a matrix organization. And you go from a weak matrix organization. Those are the ones that are closely – closest to a functional organization. Uh, weak matrix there to a balance where there's a balance between what um, – between those that are projectized and those that are – you know, project oriented and those that are functional oriented. It's a balance in there someplace. Then there's a strong, which tends to be more like project. You might still have functional areas, but the management level for the project manager is more, um, more authority all the way to project. So that's kind of the scale of mm -hmm. the strength of the project manager. Um, now as that goes across in, in the functional to the weak management uh, matrix organization, the project manager authority is very limited. The resources are on loan and they know it. We've already right. talked about that a little bit. Their loyalty really belongs to the functional manager and the functional group. Um, and then the budgets are usually controlled by the functional managers. You have to get money from them in order to do those pieces. And pretty much everything, all the variables are outside of the project manager's control. Right. So you don't really have formal authority right you have to get you have to find another form you have to bring another form of authority right. into your own into your own authority that you're building up exactly yeah that's um, what i'm doing and and in some cases you're not even known as a project manager uh, we talked last time um, how to become a project mm -hmm. manager there are those people who are doing project management work. Oh yes, that yes, aren't yes, called yes. project managers. Yeah, and in the weak matrix or even in a functional organization, a project manager might be called a project coordinator. It's someone who's there to coordinate the efforts of all these other groups and try to bring it together. Crazy thing is, they're the ones without the response. They're, they're the ones with the res total responsibility, mm -hmm. but no power. And we talked about that at the beginning. The definition has to have both. Yes. Right. There has to be a balance. Mm -hmm. Now, if we swing over to the strong matrix, it's pretty much the opposite of that. The project manager has a lot more authority. They own the resources. You know, they have authority over the resources. They may own more of the budget. They may actually have a budget that they are reporting on. And the role of a project manager there is usually a full-time role. Weak matrix, part-time. Or they might have multiple projects they're working on. The um, strong matrix, usually one bigger project, project manager has full, full authority time. on that yeah. full time and working on through that. 
Mm-hmm. So you get that whole range in there. And as you're pointing out, in the weak matrix, you're going to have to use some other type of, of authority. Yeah, other because than in, the, in the strong matrix, you're going to get a, a charter. And the charter tells people he's the project manager or she's the project manager. Follow their lead. Mm-hmm. And it's important to know what your organization is. Mm-hmm. You probably know it. You probably have a feel for it. But unless you really take a look at it, you don't really start understanding where your authority lies and how you can use it. Um, so that's that's kind of an important piece of that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. You asked earlier how to use that authority. What, yes. what are some of the things how to, you how, how to go about it. Mm-hmm. So in a, in a weak matrix environment... Or the weak organization, obviously the positional authority is held by the functional manager. You know, she owns all the resources. When the project ends or fails, all those resources go back to her. Um, so since you lack that positional authority, you're going to have to find some other type of authority. Reward penalty authority is probably your quickest option. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Those members that put in extra effort on your project do better. You can, like you were saying, send an email to their manager Give and, them something. and copy them on it to make to understand, hey, this person is doing a good job. Here's an attaboy for them, right? Mm-hmm. Um, ask permission to kick in on the annual reviews for the individuals and be able to do part of that process. Uh, that if you let people know that up front before there's a problem, then they know in the back of their head that how I do on this project is going to be reflected in my annual review. Then you can curb a lot of problems ahead of time yep. you know if you wait until there's a problem and then you come out and say well just wait till your review yeah you know, you've kind of blown some of your power and you've formed an enemy right so that's probably not a good way of doing that um if someone does something good announce it as something good right reward them in public now penalize them in private but the idea is that um, you want people to know that if they do well, they'll get something for it. That's where reward and penalty functions. That's how you get that authority. It's how you wield that authority and are able to um, make it work. One of the other things you want to do, if there are performance issues, you're going to want to check with the functional manager to determine how they want to handle this. Remember, the functional manager in a, in a weak organization owns those resources mm-hmm. and owns the responsibility of the HR part of it for those resources. So from that perspective, you want to check with them as to how they want to handle issues. Do they want right. you to address them directly or do they want to be part of that discussion? Mm-hmm. Or do they want to have the discussion all themselves? That's, you know, um, if you establish that escalation process at the beginning, it will resolve conflicts. And remember... All of the responsibility, all of the authority rests on the functional manager. So if you start to try to pull any of that authority away, you're going to have a struggle and you're going to form and a you're wall. You're going to lose, very likely. Yep. Another approach is to build that referent authority. Through your actions, through your character, um, they should begin to see that you are fair, trustworthy, that you're willing to work through difficult problems with them make them see you as a type of person they want to be around and they want to help mm-hmm. succeed. The other thing is is using expert authority. For example, a strong, well-communicated scope will build confidence in the project. If you say, this is what we're doing and this is where we're headed, laying the tracks for them and clearing things out of the mm-hmm. way, mm-hmm. you're an expert in their eyes. Hey, this guy knows how to get things done. I've never worked for a project manager here who's able to get things done like he does, I want to work on more projects with him. Um, If you put up a realistic schedule that takes into account the fact that they are working on multiple other projects, they're going to see that as, hey, he cares enough to lay the tracks out there so that I have a chance of meeting these deadlines. He knows I'm not on his project 100% of the time, I'm only on it 20% of the time, and he's setting me up for success. Something as simple as holding time-conscious meetings, using agendas, sticking to them, providing minutes, those types of things as an expert project manager you should be doing anyway, but those types of things 
help make it you build so the much authority. Easier. Yeah, yeah. You know, when I'm listening to you, it kind of sounds as if you're telling me to choose the right mix. Exactly. I mean, you're in a weak matrix organization. You don't have formal authority. Well, then rely more heavily on the others. Do whatever you can in regards to your referent power, your expert power. Build reward power up. So, so find the appropriate mix that it takes for you in your particular environment. So let's let's swing over to the other other side then. Uh, projectized. What would you recommend there? Actually, if I could, I, I'd like to to say one other thing about okay. about the matrix organization. Sure. The success of a project within a matrixed organization, because everything is based on hierarchical positioning, mm-hmm. you can use that to your advantage as well. If the sponsor for your project is a VP mm-hmm. of mm-hmm. a major part of the company, then you can use that as pushing your project forward. If you have trouble getting resources from um, one of the silos, you can go to your sponsor and say, hey, you've got the authority here. Could you please use it to make this functional manager allow his person to be on my project more? So there we're talking about relationship building with the people in power so that you can use their formal authority to further your project. Right. Whether that's taking care of the resource issues you have Remember, these resources right, right, are, right. are scattered, multiple projects perhaps. You can get more of those resources to your project or other types of, um, other types of resources so that you can use the authority of the person, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. the positional authority of your sponsor to push that project forward. Okay. I think the next one then would be um, in a projectized organization. Yes. So the matrix yes. organization, we kind of covered – from a weak perspective, but you can see as you morph from weak to balanced to strong, uh, those types of things that you're working with, those types of authority you're working with, are easier to use. You gain more formal authority or more positional authority as you move up that scale. So if we jump now to the projectized side, we can look at it from a perspective, okay, we know both ends of the spectrum and, and the middle is, is uh, somewhere between that. So from a project perspective, projectized organization, this is the organization that focuses more on projects and getting things done that way. As a leader in this environment, the first thing to remember is that your authority is temporary. Mm -hmm. Your authority is only as far as your scope allows you to go. And remember also that if the project ends, so does your authority. If they, if you come in one day and they say, you know what, the budget's been scrapped for this project, there's no more project, your authority's gone. The interesting thing to remember in a consulting organization is one day you may be the project manager on one project leading five people or 10 people or 20 people um, or 100 people. The next day you may be on a different project in which you became maybe a, a subject matter expert. And you're now reporting to someone who before was reporting to you. So that keeping that in mind helps you keep some level of humidity, humility. As you move into this environment, I think it's important to keep in mind and not let that um, positional authority of being project manager go to your head like we talked about earlier. Your referent authority will increase as... Um, the importance of it will increase. So if you can build on that referent authority, understand the individual strengths, their goals, their motivations, as part of your referent authority, if you get your team members to understand that you want to know about them, you want to know what their strengths are, you want to know um, what their goals are, what their motivations are, you can gain referent authority by doing that. But there's another thing you also do. You start to understand what is going to be their reward and penalty. If you understand that a certain person's goal is to be a project manager, as they show their leadership on your project, you can give them more project management type of work to do. 
you can also offload some of the stuff you maybe don't like doing to them. And in but the war- that can lead to abuse, right? Well, yes. What I'm what I'm what I'm saying is from the perspective of um, hey, I'm helping you become a project manager by teaching you how to handle a schedule, how to collect the timesheets from people and make sure that they're accurate. That's a vital part of project management. But in the same instance, it's something maybe that you can pass on to him to do in order to relieve you to do something else. Right. Right. So it's it can lead to abuse if the intent there is to actually mentor this person and bring them up to get more project management experience. Again, you're using your referent authority to find out that stuff, and then you're using your penalty reward authority to give those types of assignments to them. Okay. Okay. Another form of expert authority we talked about was knowledge. By keeping the team informed about the big picture and how they fit into it, it's going to build their trust as well. So your knowledge as the project manager, you've got the big picture. You've got an understanding of where you're headed. And by using that knowledge to keep your team informed and people are are curious about their future. People are curious about where they're going and why they're doing what they're doing. And you've got that knowledge. So use that to keep them informed and keep them understanding where they are. The big part about that, though, is in a project or organization, remember that as the project closes, people roll off the project. Yes. Well, those people rolling off a project don't have a home to go back to. They don't have those silos of the functional organization anymore. They are, in some cases, on their own. Keeping people informed as to when their end date is and working with them on the side to find their next project is an important thing to do. That's a form of of referent authority. Mm -hmm. Building it. Building it. You're building that trust in them. Um, It's also a form of, of expert knowledge that, hey, I as a project manager have laid out the project plan for you, and I know that in two months your services on the testing phase are no longer needed. Now, in order to keep you from running off two weeks before we finish the testing phase, I need to start thinking about what are some of the incentives, some of the rewards I can give you if you stay to the end. Absolutely. And this this becomes a bit of word of mouth authority, almost, I'd like to call it, because this is something that people will talk about, that you've done it for them, that you've made sure that they don't just fall into a hole and have nothing to do, that you've helped them, that you've helped them move forward. And that very much builds your referent power. Yes, it will. Um, I think the key to all that we've talked about so far, in the final analysis, as we look through all that we've looked at as far as authority goes, the key to successfully managing any project is to recognize where your real authority lies and okay, where the real authority for the project lies, whether it's in the functional manager mm-hmm. or in the project manager, and to understand where you derive your authority from. Project management ends up being a position really of dependency as much as it is a position of authority. If you can't convince the team to follow you, well, then there's no way you can lead them. Understanding this, the, you know, the positional, the referent, the reward penalty, and the expert authorities really offers you the necessary tools, as we've seen, combining them together to manage successfully. What do you do, however, if you notice that you've lost some authority or all authority on your project? What do you do now? How do you go about building it back up again in your ongoing project? That's a good question, and I've, I've seen project managers who have uh, who've lost it uh, in more ways <laughs> in than one. In more ways than one, <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, I think the first thing you need to do is, is determine what happened, determine where, where the weakness is. If you look back through, um, through the different authority types, figure out which type of authority dropped. Why are you no longer the expert? Um, maybe you had uh, a VP come in and, and just read you the riot act. And so your positional authority in the eyes of everybody around you has been dropped. Whatever that cause of that, whatever caused the erosion of that authority, you need to figure it out um, and see if it's fixable. The VP coming in and, and yelling at you. Yeah, that's a bad one. Th- that You the, lose face in the eyes of most people. Right. 
And so you may have to drop that type of authority for a time. That's something that might be able to be built back up again, but you might switch to some other authority. I don't know if sympathy is a character trait, but if <laughs> perhaps uh, uh, some of your authority can come back just uh, on, on people recognizing that, uh, hey, when he's down, you don't kick him. That could be a starting point. But you use those things to start building it back up, right? One of the things to make sure is that there aren't uh, outside forces at work. One of the big challenges to expert authority is when management changes. Mm -hmm. If your uh, company just changed hands and all of the management that you were aware of is now gone, uh, you've lost that expert authority in their eyes. You have to reprove yourself there. So whatever those... Wherever the weakness is, wherever the erosion started, you need to stop it if you can and and build up other areas as you go along. Um, if it's a positional plunge, um, you could reestablish maybe the project position as opposed to your position. Hey, let's let's focus our energy back onto this project because it's such an important project. We can use that to push forward and my positional authority or whatever the authority I've lost focus the attention back on the project as opposed to me as an individual. You could also find new upper management friends. If you can get another VP who steps in and says, you know, this guy's not so bad. Well, then that helps build that authority back up again. You know, when I listen to us, it almost, it almost sounds like Machiavelli. You know, you're, you're kind of thinking about authority. You're, you're molding authority. You're trying to change it. I don't think that the audience and project manager in general actually think about authority like this and building it and what do I need to do in order to gain this type and that type or the other type of authority. I think most of us probably do this almost instinctively maybe. You know, you try to find ways to build your authority, but you've never thought about it in such a detailed way that there really are four types of authority and that you need to build yourself the right mix, right? You do it out of a gut feeling. You know you have a certain type of formal authority because you have a charter that you've been given. You know that you're an expert as well. And you know that you get some some expert authority from there. You get some referent authority as well. But you've never really brought it to the forefront of your mind thinking about it and really making these conscious decisions, these conscious thoughts, like you have just laid them here down for us on the plate. And I like that approach because it, it shows to me that we need to need to think more openly about these things. I yeah. can give you a, a, a quick example of that. Um, we do it all the time, and we don't realize that it is a form of positional authority. Um, when I write an email and I say, the VP of finance wants an answer to this question, I get a quicker answer than just saying, hey, I as the project <laughs> manager want an answer to this question. Yes, yes. You're using the formal, the positional authority of that VP as you're writing that email. Since I've started looking at these four types of authority, those things pop into my head and I go, you know what? I'll get a quicker answer if I do this than if I just write it this way. I have to admit, I'm guilty of that. Not three hours ago did I send off an email in which I said, our client wants this problem fixed by tomorrow. I didn't exactly. say we need to fix this problem by tomorrow. I said our client wants it fixed because I knew exactly if I, if I formulate it that way, that's what gets it done. And it's, it's just, it's just <laughs> what you said funny. earlier. It's these types of authority are things that we do by nature anyway. Yes. It's just a matter of, of not, not trying to build an empire, not trying to beat people into submission. It's about, and, and the whole purpose of authority, the whole purpose is to accomplish the goals of either the project or the organization. Mm -hmm. It's not about building your power. It's not about making your fiefdom. It's about accomplishing the goals of the project or your organization. So we're not looking at this as, as a means of how can I, and, and I purposely try to not use the word power throughout this conversation. 
It's authority. And authority has a responsibility and authority has a purpose, right? And we bring those together in order to accomplish what we set out to do. But by studying it and by understanding, well, why did I use the VP's name? Why did I use the client's name in that email? It's because I recognize, even if my people that work for me don't recognize it as positional authority, that's what it is and that's why it works. Wonderful. I think that was an excellent summary of this whole topic of authority. Thank you very much. I appreciate that you joined us today. It's been a great pleasure talking to you again. It's been fun to be here. I hope you have me back another time.